My name is Andy Kirk, and in this video, I want to talk to you about the importance of editorial thinking. Now, this is a wide ranging subject. At its heart, it's about these two things. On one hand, being curious and the importance of opening your mind to the possibilities of potential analysis, potential questions you could pursue in your work about the topic you are working on. It's also about being decisive and the notion of editing, making decisions about what to include, what not to include and how. So to begin with the issue of curiosity, everything in DataViz starts with a curiosity. It might be your curiosity. It might be your judgment or anticipation of what you think your audience will be curious about. It may be that your client, your manager, your customer tells you what they are curious about and you need to sort of inherit that and explore gathering the data and then analyzing the data. Because at its heart and its core purpose, data visualization is about facilitating understanding. So if that's the outcome, if that's the aim that we're trying to achieve, curiosity is the starting point. And these are the two ends that meet. But what understanding are we facilitating? This is the key thing that we need to start off with in any process. When you are making a data viz, an infographic, anything that reports data visually, we need to think and define what understanding we are facilitating. And it can be anything. It can be very specific. It can be very open and ambiguous. But in the start of your process, always try to brainstorm and write down and define a curiosity or several curiosities that you think your work is attempting to facilitate understanding about. And it will help your focus. Now, listen, you can change it. It can evolve as you go through. Maybe as you, you become more familiar with your data and its prospects, you'll change course. But you need to start somewhere. A project I recently worked on was to visualize Seinfeld, the US sitcom from the 90s. This is a huge project. And my curiosity was to investigate visualizing the rhythm and texture of every episode. So the idea was that I wanted to sort of almost deconstruct the shows into this sense of almost like a musical composition. When were the characters on screen? Who got the laughs? Which locations were used? And then sort of statistically analyze who has the most appearances, who gets the most laughs. But the starting point was the curiosity. And that gave me a, a sense of what I would pursue, but crucially also what I would not pursue. It gave me a wish list or a, a shopping list of data to collect. In this case, it was a qualitative inquiry. And these were the things I was going to collect data about the timelines, the moments, the structure of the scenes, the character usage, the laughter and the locations. And that led me to collect data about those things. Once again, there were lots of things I could have also collected, but did not. And then I guess another extension of defining your initial curiosity is also recognizing what you won't do, what opportunities do exist but that you are not going to pursue. Because once again, it helps to sharpen your focus. Just take a little moment to think and pause the video for a couple of minutes and ever think if you were to work on a task to visualize a movie, uh, a movie series, maybe a TV show, maybe a musical or a theatrical performance, doesn't really matter. And you can pursue any curiosity. What would you explore? and assume that you can get any data you wish, what would you be interested in? Have a think for a few moments. For me, having watched recently back the Avengers movies, I'm kind of now curious on reflection about the character usage. When do they appear in scenes together? When do you see that actually 
certain characters have not been in the same scene as other characters? Um, what's the proportion of screen time spent fighting? I find this incredibly boring to watch because you generally know that no one will die. So what proportion of the actual movies are spent in battle? And also what's the equity of the script? Is it possible to see through how the, the movies were edited that there may be some underlying contractual requirements that different movie stars have to have the same equal amount of dialogue as other movie stars. Once again, there's so many things you could explore about the Avengers, about the use of colour, about the, the different superpowers that they've all got. But pursuing your curiosities, pursuing your interests is a really useful guide to help you to sort of explore a particular passion. That's one side of the equation. The other side is about being decisive. Any creative activity that we undertake, whether it's a visualization, a graphic, a report, an article, involves editing, deciding what to include, how to include it, but also what not to include. And this is about shifting the, the process down just before you start to decide about charts that you might use. And before you start to think about colors, and layout, you need to understand the contents that you'll need to include in your work to answer the main curiosity that your work is attempting to facilitate understanding about. And it's quite informative to think about data viz, charts, graphics, in the same notion of photography. And as this quote from Moritz Stefaner explains, a photo is never an objective reflection. It's an interpretation of reality and it's highly subjective. It's highly editorial and so is data viz. We as makers of data viz are entirely responsible for all the content decisions. So we need to take that responsibility to decide clearly what to include and what not to include to answer our curiosity. And think about photography photography, photographs, photojournalism. There's all sorts of ways that you can sort of distort reality. This photograph in Paris in the rise of the Gilets Jaunes shows that in a sense that Paris is burning near the Arc de Triomphe. And then actually you see it from a different angle and it's a very distorted view of a very small little fire that gives the impression of this disaster that looms. So, we have a great responsibility with charts like we do with photographs. We can bend the truth, we can bend reality, we can make things look bigger than they are, we can make things look smaller than they are. So that there is so much on our shoulders that we have to take responsibility for. We need to have integrity, we need to be truthful and we need to be trustworthy. So there are three things, three perspectives, three editorial perspectives that we need to carefully consider before we start to select the charts and the design factors I listed earlier, we need to make some decisions about these three aspects. First of all, we're gonna sort of deconstruct this chart, looking at these three perspectives. This is a chart from quite a few years ago now about American football. And it was to celebrate the achievement of Peyton Manning, a quarterback who at that point broke the record for the number of touchdown passes by a quarterback in NFL. So we begin with thinking about editorial angle. What's the angle of analysis? What's the view of your data? What's the photograph you are taking of your data? Do you need one? Do you need several to help people to synthesize understanding? The word relevant or relevance in this case is really important. Given all the things that you could say, what will you say is the central decision that we need to make. And it's this intersection between, on one hand, all the things that you think could be useful, interesting to the audience about this subject. And on the other hand, for you as a visualizer, what's possible for you to say and to show people about a subject. The intersection is where these two worlds meet because there'll be lots of things you could say that's not relevant to them. There'll be lots of things that they want to understand 
that's not relevant to you because you don't have data about that thing. So what view is most relevant? This is analysis of how people in Britain basically th think the government spends their taxes on different government departments. So the donut chart on the right is a breakdown of the average from a survey asking people, what do you think is the breakdown of spending? And on the left hand side, you've got the actual breakdown of spending. These two views, two donut charts are possible. They are available in the data. A part to whole relationship is possible for both the actual and perceived. But I would argue that it's less relevant than it is to compare for each of these departments, the difference between the actual and perceived. Now it's difficult to make that judgment that one of these is more important than the other. It comes down to instinct, maybe asking your audience if it's possible. I would argue that in this case, given that the question in the survey was about people's perceptions, that the most compelling view of the answers will be to compare perceptions with reality. So comparing the delta between all these different departments, in which case the most relevant view of that data would be through something like a connected dot plot, where you've got the green dots for the actual, the pink dots for the perceived, and the connecting bar is the delta, the difference. We can now see it. We don't have to calculate it mentally by looking at two separate charts. The, the delicacy of language about the angle of analysis that you are offering through your visuals is really important. The context here is the London tube map. The tube map does not answer how do I get from the shard, that tall skyscraper, to Lord's cricket ground. The tube map does answer how do I get from London Bridge Station to St John's Wood Station. The tube map serves the function of navigating around the system of different stations and tube lines in the London underground system. You need to know your origin station and your destination station to use that. If it also had to be a tool that provided references to landmarks and famous buildings or places, it would need to be a hugely different solution. So that solution that we see in the current classic design serves the function of answering that question. And sometimes you need multiple views to answer multiple questions. And this graphic from over 10 years ago from the New York Times, it's about how does a whale feed? That's the main curiosity that this attempts to answer, but it's not answerable by a single piece of analysis. It needs four or five separate content items to collectively synthesize the reader's understanding. So once again, you need to make decisions about those post-it notes. Before the charts, the post-it notes. What do I include? What do I want to show people? Going back to the main example, the angle of analysis here can be expressed as how have quantitative values changed over time for multiple categories. The categories are the quarterbacks, individual lines. The quantitative values are the cumulative touchdowns across their careers. It will show other things as well, such as the shape of careers, the number of people maybe had injuries or breaks in their careers, but that's the main thing. This attempts to provide a view about. Secondly, editorial framing. What data to include and by extension, what data to leave out? Because you might have lots of data to work with. It doesn't mean to say that you have to or should use it all there may be quite a reasonable rationale for narrowing this frame. Think of photography again. What's in the frame of your photograph? We can leave things out, we can leave things in. So what's, first of all, what's representative of the truth? What, what is a faithful representation of your data? Because sometimes we can leave things out that were quite important. An example from several years ago, uh, several, 30, 40 years ago now, a photograph of Diego Maradona in the World Cup match against Belgium in the 1982 World Cup match. So yeah, 39 years ago, not a few years ago. Now this 
the photograph would imply that Maradona was so good at football that the Belgians had to put six defenders on him to stop him scoring. That's the implication from this quite narrow frame. The reality is different. This was a moment in the match when there was a free kick for Argentina and Maradona was still there on the photograph in the top right. The ball is to the left of the screen and the six Belgians are kind of forming a wall. The ball reaches Maradona, the wall breaks up, the photographer is on the side of the pitch, taking that narrow frame. So it's a famous photograph, but it's relevant to the football match itself is actually quite limited. It's not exactly Maradona charging towards goal about to score. The point is we need a wider frame to understand the representativeness of this sample of a moment in a match. We need more data in our view. This creature was above my head a few years ago. It looks terrifying, doesn't it? it? Did to me. And then you slowly realize it's actually less sinister than you thought it was, but only when you put it into context of scale, it's very small next to a, the size of a pen. And sometimes we put out numbers and facts and figures without some sense of context without other data points to say, is this good or bad? Is this big or small? Is this growing or shrinking? We need context. This diagram shows you the, the walking paths where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin physically wandered when they landed on the, on the moon. Now, on its own, you wouldn't quite fully grasp potentially just how far or actually how very close to the lunar module they stayed whilst on the moon. To give it some context, there's a football pitch. So you can get some sense of relatability about the size of this expanse that they wandered around. Sometimes though, we give people too much. We give them all the data and it's excessive. When people just want to know the answer, where is Wally? Well, Wally is there. Maybe that's the frame that we actually need to reduce the problem down to. So you've got to find this sweet spot. In this analysis of the companies that did well as at June of last year, out of the pandemic in terms of the market capital gain, there's quite a lot of companies. Now there's probably too many to include in a single piece analysis. So there's a cutoff point for inclusion in this chart by the Financial Times, where only those with at least a billion dollars in market capital gain are included. So there will be many others that did make money, but not quite enough for inclusion in this work. Why $1 billion? I've got no idea. It just seems a logical, rational sort of cutoff point to apply. Another way to think about excessive data is you give people too much to process. So. Imagine this analysis of flight patterns across Europe before and after the pandemic. Imagine an animation showing all these flights everywhere, buzzing around the, the countries and then sort of getting quieter and quieter. It would be a compelling viewpoint, but if you can only show that in static imagery, well, you wouldn't show every single day from January through to March. So two frames side by side before and after still captures the essence of the re vast reduction in air traffic. But you've consciously chosen those two moments to bring out the story. Back to this main piece, the framing applied to this, 1930 to 19th of October 2014, when it was published. So that was the point at which it was accurate. Maybe one week later, it's out of date. And although it's many quarterbacks, it's not every. Only those with at least 30 touchdown passes are included. I've got no idea why 30, but it seems a sensible cutoff point to really establish the content being just about those players who had something of a sustained and successful career. Finally, editorial focus. Which items of your data are potentially more important than others? So this is distinct from framing which is about including or excluding. Focus is about emphasis. Which of those items merit extra em emphasis, stand out to the audience? And again, this is a very editorial judgment, but it may be something that helps you to combine 
two different perspectives. First of all, we want to know where Wally is, but we also want to give people all the data and a quite a wide frame of other data items to explore and to view. So by adding a little box and a caption, you point out things of importance to your audience. And the similar approach has been applied in this FT piece. 55 years of rainfall patterns is an overwhelming, excessive amount of content. But by highlighting 12 extreme interesting cells, month by month, you give people a sense of the headlines. Here are the 12 most important, most interesting elements to view. And if you want to go deeper and explore the rest, you're very welcome to do so. But we want to make it palatable. We want to make it something that you can consume and get some quick takeaways from. So these little boxes, these little different coloured emphasis features make those values stand out. And I do refer a lot to the FT because I think they're so good at this idea of editorial judgments. In this case, it isn't just every company over $1 billion in market capital gain is as equally important as others. We get the top 100 have a colour, the rest are greyed out. Of those top 100, the top 25 are then labelled. So there's almost three tiers of editorial focus, as well as the editorial framing for inclusion or exclusion. Going back to this, you can see the main guy, Peter Manning, stands out. Thick blue line, bold label, shouts at you. The other current players have yet to finish their careers. They have a blue line and a label. The previous record holders or famous players have a dark line and a label. Everyone else is in the background, subdued, grayscale, no labels, included for shape, but not for detail. So in summary, what contents do you need to include in your work to communicate the most relevant understanding to your audience? What angle or angles of analysis, what views of your data to show? what data to include or to leave out, that's the framing, and where relevant, are there any elements of features that are important to emphasize and to draw focus towards? So that's the importance of editorial thinking. Mm -hmm.